Today's speaker is uh, Dr. Patrick Alkin, and he graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics from Drexel University in 2003, and then he received a PhD in Physics from CU Boulder in 2009, working on low-latitude ionosphere electrodynamics. Uh, following that, he spent one year working at IPGP in Paris, uh, developing a level two data product on the elect equatorial electrojet for the Swarm satellite mission. And after that, he returned to CU to join Ceres and also work with the NOAA geomagnetism group, which is responsible for building the world magnetic model an enhanced magnetic model. And Patrick's interest is in all aspects of geomagnetic field, uh, including the core litho lithospheric field and ionosphere and magnetosphere field modeling. So today he will talk about the secular variation and secular acceleration as seen from DMSP satellite magnetic measurements. Uh, thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, Nick, and thank you all for coming and for inviting me uh, to be your seminar speaker today. So today I'd like to talk to you about the temporal changes of the field which is generated inside the Earth's core, so the magnetic field generated in the Earth's core. However, uh, and you might ask why we use DMSP magnetic measurements to look for these uh, very subtle signals coming from the core especially when there exist other satellite missions which are uh, designed from the ground up to, to provide really high quality measurements of the Earth's magnetic field. So for example, there's the CHAMP mission, which is a German satellite which flew for 10 years, 2000 to 2010, which made really marvelous measurements of the Earth's magnetic field. And then there was a follow-on mission to CHAMP called SWARM, which was launched in 2013, which is currently still flying and also providing really nice measurements. However, there's this three-year gap period between CHAMP and SWARM. So from about late 2010 until late 2013, we don't have any magnetic field measurements from space. And so this is sort of the gap that uh, DMSP, that we hope that DMSP can fill, because it turns out we see a lot of very interesting signals coming from the core during this three-year period. And I'll, I'll show you some more about that. I just want to mention my co-authors, Niels Olsen and Chris Finley. Uh, this work originated last summer when I spent two months working with them at their institute in Copenhagen, Denmark. They work at the Danish Technical University. Can I ask, is, was the Ørsted mission relevant to this study? Yeah, so Ørsted is actually still flying. Uh, that also it started earlier. Yeah, Ørsted was launched before CHAMP in yeah. 1999. The absolute scalar magnetometer failed in 2005, and so it wasn't providing, and that was used to calibrate the vector measurements. And so there was no vector measurements after 2005 for Earth. However, Earth had continued to provide scalar measurements. They basically just took the modulus of the vector magnetic field up until about 2013. However, the satellite started tumbling sometime around 2010, 2011. And so the, the amount of data that they were actually able to get during this time period was very sparse. I mean, incredibly sparse data after the CHAMP mission. So it, for our purposes, it's not really useful for filling in this gap period. But um, OK, so an outline of my talk, uh, I'll give an introduction and the motivation behind why we were looking into the, this data. I, I'm going to spend a significant amount of this talk talking about the of the data on DMSP. Because as I mentioned, the, the quality of the DMSP data is much worse than uh, a nice mission like CHAMP or SWARM. And so we had to do a lot of quality control and cleaning of this data to make it, to put it into a form where we can actually extract geophysical signals out of this data. Once I go through that, I'll talk about the main field modeling. This is uh, the process by which we analyze these secular variation and secular acceleration signals. We fit models to this data. I'll show you some of the results that we found looking at the secular acceleration from DMSP. I'll talk about some validation studies we did with ground observatories, and finally, conclusions. So in the last few years, uh, essentially since the beginning of the CHAMP mission, we've found a, a lot of exciting uh, features, a lot of exciting phenomena inside the Earth's core which were not known prior to the satellite era. So for example, this is a study which was done in 2014 by 
a colleague of mine, Arno Shulia, who was looking at uh, secular acceleration models during the ch built from the CHAMP satellite, for, so from 2000 to 2010. And <clears throat> maybe I should use the pointer for the people on the webcast, this one. <clears throat> so this is a figure from their paper where they're showing secular acceleration maps at the core mantle boundary. So, so what these maps are are the second time derivative of the magnetic field. So it's how the magnetic field is accelerating. This is the radial component at the core mantle boundary. So every time you see a, a, a red or a blue blob in these maps, that means in that particular region of the world, the magnetic field is accelerating uh, by some amount, you know, several hundred, uh, I think the scale is micro tesla per, per year squared. And what's really interesting about this, and this is something that we, we didn't know from the observatories before because the observatory network is just too sparse to actually see this global coverage. Um, but what CHAMP revealed was in the equatorial region, you can see here uh, around 2005, 2006, you get a, a number of pulses in the equatorial region. And so you get a region where you, know, you get a, a strong positive acceleration and a strong negative acceleration, positive, and so on. And then over time, as you progress uh, three years later, so, th so this map is, I think it's easier to use this pointer. <laughs> Um, so this map is 2006, and then just three years later in 2009, you see the same three-cell uh, pattern here in the southern Atlantic region, but now it, it, it's changed polarity from it was red, blue, red, and now it's blue, red, blue, just three years later. And this pattern has continued into the swarm era now, and so it turns out that there's this standing wave pattern in this equatorial region, which means that there's some process inside the core, which is or some kind of a wave process which is generating these acceleration pulses in the acceleration in it, with a period of about six years in, uh, in this equatorial region. And now the CHAMP mission ended shortly after this map in 2000, the CHAMP mission ended in 2010. And so uh, this, this pattern continues into the post-CHAMP era. And so the question we'd like to ask is, uh, can we use DMSP to further analyze these pulses? Now we do have observatory, ground observatory data in the post-CHAMP era. So here I'm showing you two time series. The, the top panel is from Kourou Observatory. This is located here in South America. And then here is Ascension Island, which is here in the middle of the South Atlantic. And this is the uh, radial component, time derivative of the radial component. So this is showing the secular variation, the first time derivative. And so here you can kind of see one of the pulses. I mean, both observatories you see uh, I mean, whenever you see this sort of maximum or minimum feature in, in the variation, that, that this is what's called a geomagnetic jerk. So that means there's a sudden rapid acceleration seen in the magnetic field at these, at these times. So there's one of them seen by both observatories around 2007. And then there's a strong acceleration phase, uh, which is what we saw in the CHAMP map around 2009. And then again, in, in the Ascension Island Observatory, we see another jerk around 2011 and then another strong acceleration, and then another jerk. Uh, Kourou saw a jerk here around, oh, what was it, 2012 or so. And then both observers see another jerk uh, around 2014. So you see this sort of wave pattern with a period of about six or seven years at both of these observatories. And we see these at other low latitude stations as well. And we had really nice global data coverage from CHAMP during this part uh, up until 2010. And then the SWARM mission was launched here, so we have really nice coverage here. But as you can see, there's a lot of interesting things that happen in this gray area, which is this gap period. And so the hope is that we can use the DMSP data to fill in the global knowledge of what's going on in this, in this gray gap period. Is the slope of the curve related to what you call accelerating? Yeah, so this is. The curve you're looking at here is the first time derivative. That's, so that's the variation. So the derivative of this curve is the acceleration. So the slope here, I mean, a positive slope means you have a positive acceleration. And when you have this, uh, this minimum feature here, that means the acceleration itself is rapidly changing. That's, that's like a third time derivative. Uh, so that's called a jerk. Uh, OK, so this is just indicating there's a gap here. So this is a map just showing the altitude evolution of the various satellite missions. So this is the CHAMP satellite. It was launched in 2000. 2000. It, it ran out of fuel and re-entered the atmosphere in 2010. Throughout its mission, they raised the orbit a few times. Uh, so that's these sudden uh, rate, you know, vertical uh, features in this plot um, just to prolong the mission.
looking at here is the solid curve is the daily mean altitude of the satellite, and the envelope curves are the daily minimum and maximum altitudes. And then you have this about three-year gap period, and then you have the SWARM satellite mission, which launched in late 2013. SWARM is a, a mission with three satellites with nearly identical instrumentation. The, there's a lower pair, SWARM A and C, which are flying side by side next to each other. And then uh, there's a higher altitude satellite, SWARM B, which is about 510 kilometers altitude. So now I'm showing you uh, the altitude of the one of the DMSP satellites. So DMSP is, is uh, referenced by number. So there's a satellite called F-15. Um, I'm only showing data from 2008. I think it was actually launched in 2003, but I only have the data starting in 2008. And here it goes to October 2013. Unfortunately, the magnetometer on this failed in October 2013, so that's why it stops there. But we have other DMSP satellites as well. So for example, here's the F-17 satellite. And this is nice because we it covers the full gap period, plus it covers a significant portion of the swarm mission. So we can basically compare the different data sets uh, at, during the same time intervals. And we also have two other DMSP satellites. There's a 16 and an 18. I, I just haven't plotted them here so to keep the plot from being too busy. Um, but they cover similar time periods as the 17 satellite. Uh, yeah, so just a, a word about the uh, DMSP satellites. So, so in this study, I'm considering four, four of the satellites. And th these four are special because they have boom-mounted magnetometers. Prior to the F-15, they had body-mounted magnetometers. And that means the data is even noisier than, uh, than these. And so I'm only considering uh, from F-15, 16, 17, and 18, which have these uh, five-meter boom. And then there's a fluxgate magnetometer on top of this boom. <coughs> And the boom is directed anti-radially, so it's kind of pointing uh, upward. Does helium flux gate magnetometer? No, I, I I don't know exactly the specifications of the instrument. I, I don't think they're helium-based. But um, the orbital inclination is 98.8 degrees, so that means there's about an 8.8 degree polar gap that's not covered. Um, the period is 102 minutes. Their altitude is about 850 kilometers, which is similar to the Ersted. And they're sun synchronous. So this table is showing the local time of the ascending node and descending node for the four satellites. So 15 and 17 are both in dawn-dusk orbits. So it's about 6 AM to 6 PM local time. 16 and 18 are at 8 AM to 8 PM local times. OK, so we're going to move into the calibration of this data. Uh, so this is a multi-step process. So we start with the level 1B data, which comes from the level 1B processor, which is uh, provided by the Air Force, who operates this, these satellites. The level 1B data has numerous problems with it. There's a, uh, a number of noise sources. Uh, there's also fields uh, from other instruments on And so we put this into a, a data cleaning procedure. And I'll show you some examples of that. And the purpose of this is to remove impulsive noise and also other spacecraft fields. Then we move into the scalar calibration. So normally, on a really nice mission like CHAMP or SWARM, there's actually a completely second, separate second instrument which measures the measurement. On DMSP, the magnetometer. And so we have to use a geomagnetic field model to do the calibration instead of having another instrument. So I'll talk about that. And then finally, we have to do an attitude correction. So again, on a, on a nice mission like Champ and Swarm, there's a, they carry star cameras sit, situated right next to the flux gate, which allow you to orient the satellite in space and convert that vector measurement into a geographic coordinate system. DMSP doesn't have a star camera. Uh, and so I'll talk about how we actually try to get the attitude information from the satellite. Um, and then finally, we come up with a, a final data set, which is then used as the basic link from which we can extract the interesting signals coming from the core. OK, so starting with the data cleaning. So this is an example uh, of a time series of data that's recorded from the F-15 satellite. So this is uh, 2009. This is just about two orbits worth of data. And this is the, uh, the radial component, so the vertical field component, 
in the instrument frame, and I've subtracted a field model. So I've taken a reference field model, I've rotated that model into the instrument frame and subtracted it. So that you're looking at the residuals. And you see this sort of large scale variation along these orbits, and that's just because the data hasn't been calibrated yet. And so uh, that would be removed later in the calibration process. But for now, you can also see these single point spikes throughout this time series. Um, so this is called, in, these are called impulses or impulsive noise. And these spikes are quite large, uh, and it's important to remove them because they can contaminate the, 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 the following processing steps. You can also see a number of other noise sources in here. So for example, here and here, there are these square wave type features. Uh, and we believe those are due to other instruments on the satellite, such as the magneto torquers. There could be heaters or solar panels, basically anything uh, electronic on the satellite that turns on, stays on for a few minutes, and then it turns off. So when it turns on, you suddenly get this, this jump in the time series, and it stays for a few minutes, and then it turns off, and it, it jumps back down to the baseline. Uh, so I'll talk about removing those in the next slide. But right now, I'll just talk about removing the impulse noise. Um, this is a fairly standard problem in, in, in time series analysis. Um, so there are a number of different filters you can use to, to remove these. I'm using a filter which was developed by Hample back in the 1970s. Um, and the way it works is um, for each sample in the time series, which I call XK, I define a window surrounding that sample. And I take the median of that window, which I call MK. And the reason I use the median and not the mean is because the mean can be heavily contaminated by even a single outlier. So if you have just one outlier in your window, the mean would be contaminated. But the median is, is considered robust to, even if uh, a little bit less than half of your window is filled with outliers, the median will still be robust to that. And so you consider the absolute deviation. You take your sample. You subtract the median, and you want the absolute deviation from the median. And if that's a relatively small number, less than some scale size, then you say, OK, there's, it's not an outlier. I just, I just keep the sample the same. But if that distance is larger than some multiple of some scale size, then you say, OK, it must be an outlier, so I'll replace it with the median. And so the question now is, how do you define a scale size? So there's a number of different ways you can do that. Uh, the way I'm using is, is to use the MAD, which is called the median absolute deviation. Uh, it's basically the median of all the absolute deviations of your samples from the median in your window. Uh, and this is also considered robust to outliers. So, so SK is really an estimate of your sigma, your standard deviation in your window. But you want it to be robust to outliers. So that's why, I mean, if you basically had Gaussian data with no outliers, the MAD would approach the, the standard deviation. So we define a scale, SK, and then T is just uh, essentially how many, how many sigmas do you need to identify an outlier. And I, I use T equals 3. And I'm using an 11-point window for this. And so the results of doing this uh, are shown here in green. And so you can see that it basically uh, re you know, it keeps the signal the same except for these impulse points where it just replaces those by the median. Uh, and it just generally, it works pretty well for uh, this data. And if you, if you take the difference between these two, you can kind of see the magnitude of these spikes, uh, which are about 20 nanotesla. And that's, that's quite large for when you're trying to model signals coming from the core. A 20 nanotesla noise uh, can really disrupt. OK, so next I want to talk about the spacecraft fields. So these are these square wave features in this data. So this is a time series from the F-17 satellite. And this is about three orbits worth of data. And you can just count the peaks, because uh, the data hasn't been calibrated yet. So essentially, each of these peaks corresponds to one orbit. And you can see there's a lot of uh, square wave type features here due to other instruments on the board turning on and off. Now, detecting and correcting these is not as simple as the impulse noise. Um, and we're still experimenting with different ways of doing this. Um, but in the statistical literature, the, the, this is called edge detection. There's actually used a lot in image processing. People are trying to find sharp uh, transitions between, uh, from one data point to the other. And there's no perfect way of doing this. Um, the way that, that's sort of accepted is to um, sort of smooth your data so that uh, you try to minimize the noise in your data. And then you take a derivative. So you want to take the basically a time derivative of this. 
And that's shown here in green. So this is the difference. Uh, it's basically just first differences between from one sample to the next. And so most of it's fairly small, but whenever you get a, a sudden transition from one sample uh, to another, you get a spike in your first differences. And so these spikes essentially represent where these edges are occurring. Now you might say, well, what, maybe you could just define a threshold and say any spike that's larger than your threshold is an edge and we've detected our edge. But actually it turns out that's not a very, uh, it's not a good way of detecting them because, uh, for example, when you have a large variance in your signal, like this, this larger scatter here is actually geophysical. That, this is in the polar region. This is due to the field aligned currents and the polar electric jets in the polar region. And you can see just by having a larger scatter, you actually get some spikes in your first differences here because this noise is, is usually amplified by differential filters. And sometimes the, the spikes you see here are actually larger than, uh, like for example, here, um, for this edge here, or maybe this one. Um, this spike is actually larger than this one. This one actually corresponds to a square wave edge, whereas this one does not. And so you can't just use a simple threshold to try to determine where these edges are. And so again, we need some kind of estimate of scale. And so I'm using, again, a similar procedure where I define a window and I define a scale uh, using the median absolute deviation. That's shown here in red. So that means wherever you have a larger variance in your, in your signal, you get a larger uh, scale factor or a larger sigma. And you can use that to kind of uh, estimate where these outliers are occurring. And so um, when, when I do that, I basically make detections which are shown in yellow. So the, these yellow lines are showing where, where I, I decide there's an edge. And more or less, they line up correctly with uh, the actual edges in, in these square waves. But uh, sometimes you get false positives. Uh, sometimes it doesn't detect things properly. Um, there's, it, it, I'm still trying to tune this to make it uh, better. But we also have the added advantage that in our, in our problem, usually we have, uh, with, with the case of an instrument turning on for a few minutes and then turning off, you basically get an upward jump by some amount, and then a short time later you get a downward jump by a similar amount. And so you can actually use that information to try to say, okay, if I, see, if I detect an edge here by some amplitude, and then I detect it a few minutes later here by a similar amplitude, and it's in the opposite direction, that actually helps to eliminate false positives as well. Um, now the process which we actually, once we've detected these, these features, the process to actually correct for them, uh, that's, that's even more complicated. I'm not going to go into the details of how we do that. Uh, but basically the idea is just to try to estimate what offset do you have to add to these samples to bring it back down to the baseline of the, sigma, to, of the signal. Um, and we've developed some techniques to do that. And the results are now here, shown in the dark green. Uh, and so you can see now that all of these square waves have basically been eliminated from, from this signal by just adding appropriate offsets to those samples. I want to show you another example of, this, of doing the same thing. This is for the F-16 satellite. And F-16 is a little interesting because it's a, a little noisier than the other satellites. And noise has a big effect on whether we can properly detect these, these features. Uh, so you can see that the scatter is a lot larger in this signal than in the previous one. Uh, so again, here's the, the first differences. So now you can see much more noise in the first differences. Uh, but you still see spikes where you see the, the samples. Um, here in red is shown the scale factors. So we get a larger sigma where you get more scatter. And then the detected edges in yellow. And then finally the corrected time series in dark green. And you can see most of the most of the these square wave features are corrected. Um, but you can see, for example, here it didn't detect this one. So it detected the rightmost edge, but it didn't detect the left one, so it didn't correct that one. But the other ones were corrected. So this is just to show that it's not a perfect procedure. It doesn't, it doesn't work 100% of the time. So we're still trying to improve this. Um, but these types of features, it's critical to correct these, because uh, the next step is the calibration. And if you, if you try to put a time series like this into the calibration, features like this would, would drastically reduce the quality of the calibrated data. OK, so now I'll talk about how we calibrate this instrument. Um, so basically, all flux gate magnetometers are calibrated with nine parameters. So 
Uh, in this equation on the left-hand side is the calibrated vector field. Uh, the, I call this vector flux gate magnetometer, VFM. So that's the result of the calibration. And then here we have a matrix called P, which represents non-orthogonality factors. So when a flux gate instrument is built, uh, it's usually designed with three cores, which are mechanically aligned to be orthogonal to each other. But of course, once the instrument's operating and it's in, f in space flying, there's, there are noise sources. There's thermal noise, there's mechanical noise that can cause these directions to become slightly non-orthogonal. So you have to apply a correction to mathematically bring these three uh, flux gate directions back into an orthogonal coordinate system. And so you have three angles, U1, U2, U3, which are designed to do that. Then you have these scale factors, S. This is just a diagonal matrix, with three numbers, uh, for when you have a <clears throat> when you have an uncalibrated vector field E. So this is essentially the the measurement which is coming directly out of the instrument. So this is usually in engineering units like vol volts or or uh, amps or something like that. And the scale factors are just factors which trans transform those voltages into physical units such as Tesla. Uh, and so each of the cores has its own scale factor. And then finally, you have an offset vector, which is just three numbers, which represent any remnant magnetization near the instrument. So if you have any magnetic material near the instrument, which contribute a, a constant field in the instrument frame, these offsets would account for that. So basically, you have these nine parameters, three offsets, three scale factors, three non-orthogonality angles. And these have to be determined uh, in order to calibrate the data. Now, as I said before, normally for a, uh, a mission such as Champ or Swarm, they actually have a second instrument located near the flux gate, which measures the absolute strength of the field. And that's used to determine these nine calibration parameters. On DMSP, we don't have that. So we have to use uh, an a priori model, a geomagnetic field model. And we use a model which is called Chaos 6. Um, and it's built from. During this, period, during this gap period where there's no satellite data, chaos is built from observatories. So essentially, we're calibrating the DMSP data with uh, observatory models. And to determine these nine parameters, we take the, the absolute uh, the magnitude of the, the reference model, and we subtract the absolute value of this calibrated vector. And these nine parameters are hidden in these uh, three terms, P, S, and O. And by minimizing this residual over many orbits, you can get a robust estimate of these nine parameters. And this is just uh, showing the results. So the, the blue curve is a time series now. So this is F15 time series over oh, from 2008 to 2014. Uh, and this is the original data before I did any cleaning, before I did any calibration. This is just the original level, level 1B data, uncalibrated. And then for F17, this is from 2009 to 2017. So this is eight years of data. And the RMS is about 33 nanotesla for this one, 28 for, for this one. And then after I did the cleaning and the calibration, the residuals look like this. Um, so a lot of these systematic features you see in, in the original data, um, I mean, these are due to these, these sharp edges that are coming from the spacecraft fields. So most of those are gone now. And the, and the RMS is reduced from 33 down to 20, 23, and then 28 down to 23. So um, this is sort of the, the best we can do with this data. I mean, if you look at something like Swarm or Champ, uh, the RMS of that would be something you know, less than a nanotesla. So this, that, this instrument is really 20 times noisier than uh, a really nice mission like Champ or Swarm. But, but we just have to deal with that. I mean, it's, it's, it's the only thing we have. So. So we're looking at about 23 nanotesla RMS noise after the calibration. So the last step um, before we can look at interesting science uh, with this data is we have to look at the attitude uh, correction. So normally, uh, it'd be nice to have a star camera next to the flux gate instrument, which can orient you in space. DMST doesn't have a star camera. However, as I mentioned before, the primary purpose of DMSP is to take pictures of clouds and make predictions of weather. And so the attitude control system on the satellite is designed to keep the satellite fixed uh, within 
0.01 degrees of the geodetic vertical direction. So it always wants to be pointing straight down. How do you do that without <laughs> It uses magneto torquers, but I don't know the, the details of how. I mean, I know there are big well, magneto torquer fields in. Yeah, I, I don't know how it determines how far off it is from geodetic vertical, but I mean, the, the, the attitude control system is based on magneto torquers. So it's those same magnetometers. Well, the magneto torquers have their own magnetic sensors, uh -huh. which are different from the flux gate. Yeah, I, it's a good point. I, I don't know the details of how it works. But this is the specification in, in this mission. They, I mean, that's the spec that they, they, that they build the satellite system. Usually, uh, I'm just curious because usually you get that kind of a spec, you need a star, a star camera. I mean, you know, you, there's a magnetic field, there's limb, and there's stars in the sun. Yeah. Okay, well, so, so we, we use this information uh, ourselves. And so one of the, the flux gate directions is actually more or less in the vertical direction. And so that means one of our, one of our axes is actually fairly well determined. Uh, so the, the so-called magnetic z-axis. Uh, so I define a spacecraft fixed coordinate system based on this knowledge. So I define one of my basis axes to be in the local geodetic vertical. So I, I say S3, is minus e mu. So e mu is just a, a unit vector in the geodetic vertical direction. And I put a negative sign so that it's pointing downward instead of upward. And then I use that as one of my basis vectors. And I assume that's fixed with respect to the spacecraft. And then for the second one, I take that vector and I cross it into the velocity vector of the spacecraft. So I also assume that as, a sa as, the, vol as the satellite's moving in its velocity direction, I assume that there's not a lot of motion relative to the velocity vector. It turns out that that's a false assumption, and I'll show you that in the next slide. But the velocity vector is really the only other vector we have that we can define a spacecraft fixed coordinate. Um, so basically, we, we, we take the cross product here, divide by the magnitude to get a unit vector. And so this S2 vector is orthogonal to both the geodetic vertical and the velocity. So since this is a polar orbiting satellite, that means S2 is pointing toward the eastward direction, roughly. And then finally, you have the third coordinate direction, which is the right-hand rule which uh, is essentially in the velocity direction itself. So um, we use this, we use this uh, coordinate basis to define a rotation matrix to rotate a vector from this coordinate system into a geographic coordinate system. And these are the so-called attitude uh, quaternions. OK, so, so we started doing this, and we realized that there was a problem because we looked at, so we found that the z component was actually fairly well uh, determined, but the x and y were not. And so we thought maybe, you know, the satellite, so we defined these two vectors, the, the geodetic vertical and the velocity direction. And we thought, well, maybe the satellite's actually rotating about the vertical direction throughout its orbit. And so we tested for this by taking the measurement. So this is now the calibrated measurement uh, in the vector flux gate frame. So this is in the instrument frame. We apply a rotation, an, an unknown rotation, about the vertical axis, so I call R3. It's just a rotation by some angle gamma. And this is the rotation matrix, which is just a rotation about the z-axis. And then once we have that, we then rotate it into a geographic system with this RQ. That's the quaternions from our spacecraft fixed coordinate system. So this, this whole term is now a vector in geographic coordinates, which we can compare with our reference model from chaos. And we try to minimize this. We try to figure out what angle do we need to rotate around the vertical axis to minimize this uh, residual. And so we plotted, the, we plotted this as a function of latitude, and this is the gamma angle. And you see that the gamma angle has a deflection of about four degrees throughout the orbit. So that means if the satellite starts at here at, the, at the, say, the North Pole, 
and then it goes to the equator. That means by the, between the North Pole and the equator, the satellite has rotated by four degrees about the vertical axis. And then by the time it gets back to the South Pole, it's rotated back, and then so on. So, it, so all in all, it's rotating plus or minus four degrees uh, throughout its orbit. And so that means that the velocity vector is not fixed with respect to the spacecraft. And so we have to correct for this. And so I came up with just a simple model. It looks, it looks a lot like a sine theta. So basically, I just say, OK, gamma is, is a sine theta with some coefficient in front. And I just added a linear term, uh, which I found worked a little bit better. Uh, so I, basically, for each track, we fit this three-parameter model for this, this correction angle gamma to try to account for this deflection. And then once we have that, we, we take this combined rotation matrix. And that is then the full attitude knowledge of the satellite. OK, so that was sort of a long introduction into the, the data processing and, and so on. So now I'd like to get more into the science uh, and, and how we, we use this data set to extract the secular variation and secular acceleration signals. So in order to do this, we have to fit a model to this data set. And so if you assume that the satellite is flying in a source-free region, so that means that there's no electrical currents, then the magnetic field is a potential field, and it can be expressed by a potential function uh, shown here. So here you just have a radial term. You have sines and cosines for the longitude dependence. You have a, a Legendre polynomials for the latitude dependence. And then you have these coefficients, g and h, which are called the Gauss coefficients. And those are what give you the knowledge of how the magnetic field is, is evolving in time. Now, of course, the satellites are not flying in a source-free region. They're, they're flying in the ionosphere. There are electrical currents. We try to minimize the effects of those currents by selecting data during quiet times. Uh, if we can, we select data during the night to minimize the day-side ionospheric field. But of course, this is an approximation, uh, but it's a generally a pretty good one. For the Gauss coefficients, which depend on time, we, we do a second-order Taylor expansion for each of those. Uh, so we have some main field term, g, and then we have a, a first derivative term, g dot, and then a second derivative term, g double dot. So that means for each spherical harmonic order and degree nm, we have six different Gauss coefficients that have to be determined. So we have the h and the g's. And we have uh, six altogether. But the, the secular variation lives in these g dot and h dot terms, and the secular acceleration lives in the g double dot and the h double dot. So we do some additional data preprocessing, because uh, when we fit these main field models, we really want a quiet, stable field with a minimized magnetosphere. We try to minimize all the external fields. So we select for geomagnetically quiet conditions, kp less than 2. <coughs> and we take the time derivative of the RC index to be less than 3 nanotesla per hour. And RC is sort of a, it's similar to a DST index. I think it's a much better representation of the ring current. Uh, because it's built from 20 different observatories, where DSC is only built from four observatories. And so we find that this, th this index is actually a much better representation of the ring current. And so we use that for our data selection. We just try to minimize, we just try to get rid of obvious outliers. So sometimes there's just a track, which is an obvious uh, anomaly. And so we take an RMS difference with an a priori model just to get rid of those types of tracks. The 15 and 17 satellites are in dawn dusk orbit, so we actually don't do any local time selection for those, because uh, the ionospheric field is already more or less small in those local times. And at high latitudes, we try to minimize the high latitude current systems by, by only taking dark data. So we require the sun to be 10 degrees below the horizon. So I built two different models for comparison. One is from the Swarm satellite mission during this three-year period, 2014 to 2017. And SWARM is, is sort of the gold standard model. So that's kind of the, the model we'll compare our DMSP models with. And then I built another model from the F-17 satellite for exactly the same time period. And so we can compare these two different uh, models. So just a word about how we build these models. Um, so we take the pre-processed data set. This, is, this has been cleaned, calibrated processed, selected for quiet times, and so on. And we define a model, which is given by this potential field term, which is due to the core field. Uh, so, so this is the V that I showed you earlier. So the Gauss coefficients 
which represent the secular variation and acceleration, live inside this term. So th those are the coefficients we're trying to solve for. Then we have a magnetosphere term because no matter how careful we are in selecting our data, there's always a magnetospheric signal. So we, so we have a very simple model to represent the ring current field uh, that we just remove from the data before fitting. And we do the same thing for the crustal field. So we, even though DMSP is actually at a very high altitude, so it doesn't really see any crustal field, but we remove a crustal model anyway. It's just standard what we do. And then we define a residual. So this is showing the satellite measurement. So this is now uh, the final measurement we have from DMSP. And we do the attitude rotation that I talked about before. So this is the attitude knowledge that we've defined with our spacecraft fixed coordinate system. We also have an Euler angle of rotation. So this just means, uh, so we've defined this satellite fixed basis with the velocity vector, the geodetic normal. But the flux gate axes may not be perfectly aligned with that. I mean, the flux gate may not be aligned exactly with the geodetic normal. It may not be perfectly aligned with the ram direction. So we do a, a fixed rotation just to bring the flux gate axes into alignment with those spacecraft fixed axes. And so we need three Euler angles to do that. So we solve for these Euler angles as part of our optimization problem. And then we have the satellite measurement. And we do the same thing for the scalar data. Uh, so this is F sat is just, the, is just the modulus of the flux gate measurement. So then we invert three years of data. We use a nonlinear least squares approach. It's a nonlinear problem, mainly because of these Euler angles. Uh, these are in a rotation matrix, so there's sines and cosines and, and so on. So, th so this is nonlinear functions of these parameters, which means we have to use a nonlinear least squares approach. And then the output of this is the Gauss coefficients and the Euler angles. We solve for both. The Gauss coefficients live in this term. And we do some regularization to minimize the power at the core mantle boundary. That just helps to kind of smooth out the model and prevent um, the high, it basically regularizes the high spherical harmonic degree terms in the model. We also do some iterative reweighting. So as I mentioned, as you've seen in, in the data that I've shown you, the, the DMSP data is incredibly noisy. And so there's significant outliers. And these outliers can have detrimental effects on the Gauss coefficients. And so we essentially fit a preliminary model. We look at the residuals. Then we assign weights. We downweight the, the large residuals. And we, and we assign higher weights to the lower residuals. And then we fit the whole model again. And we iterate this a few times. And the result is that you know, very large outliers in the data don't affect the final model very much. And finally, the output of all of this is our Gauss coefficients, which we can analyze to get these secular variation and acceleration signals. This is the model residuals from these two models that I fit. So on the left is the DMSP model. On the right are the, is the SWARM model. I'll start with the SWARM model first. This is the uh, x, y, z components in uh, northeast center frame. And then the bottom row is the, the total field scalar measurement. And this is quasi-dipole latitude on the horizontal axis. And I'm only. Uh, so I only fit the vector components below 55 degrees quasi-dipole latitude. And the reason is that the vector components are more heavily affected by the polar electrojets. Uh, you can even see the, the residuals are getting larger as it approaches about 60 degrees magnetic latitude. And so we don't want the polar electrojets to influence this model that much. And so we, we basically just use the, the vector data below 55 degrees. But we do need data at the poles to get a stable inversion. So I, I use the scalar field measurements at the poles, which are the least affected by the field aligned currents and so on. But you can see in, in the residuals that you get these larger residuals at the poles, which are due to these, these high latitude current systems. We just, we just don't have the capability to model them at the moment. So, so they're just in the data. And they do have some influence on the final model. Uh, OK, moving to the DMSP residuals. <laughs> Now, the swarm residuals look, look really nice. I mean, the, the scale on these is plus minus 40 nanotesla. It's hard to read on this, on this screen. Moving to the MSP, the, the, the scale is increased by a factor of five. So this is plus minus 200 nanotesla. So that means these residuals are five times larger than these residuals. So even though it looks similar on this scale, it, it's not. They're five times more scatter in, in these. Uh, 
And you can also see there's some structure in these residuals. In the swarm residuals, I mean, there's very little structure. Everything looks flat, which is the way it's supposed to look like. In the Z component, it does more or less look flat. And I think that's because we have the best attitude knowledge of, of that vertical component. But X and Y, you can see there's kind of strange bulges in different latitudes. And I think that's mainly because of, our, uh, of the attitude uncertainty for the X and Y components. And you can also see in the, in the total field, there's this sort of strange feature at the equator. The residuals are smaller than at the mid and high latitudes. And I think, I mean, there's two, there's two reasons I think this could be. One is the, the attitude uncertainty, and there might be something in the X and Y. Uh, and the other is, during all the data cleaning that we do, um, I mean, we're kind of modifying the original data in various ways. And it's possible that we're introducing a non-potential field into the data. And so when we fit a potential field model, the residuals might be telling us that there's something in the data which is not a potential field. And that, that could explain what this is. Um, so right now, I'm actually in the process of going back to the beginning and, and looking at every step of the processing to just to try to, to see if, if I can improve this situation. Uh, but right now, this is what the residuals look like. Do you have any hopes of backing up the electrical currents from the non-potential components? <laughs> well, I don't think it's due to electrical currents, because that, I mean, I think it's due to more of the processing that we do to this data. There's, there's many, many steps in the processing, and we're modifying the original data in various ways, which, which may be introducing these non-potential fields. So it may not be a physical current that's causing it. It may just be how we're processing the data. Um, so we're sort of trying to go back and look at every step of the processing to see if we can improve this. And these are the statistics. Uh, of the model. So the, the bottom two <coughs> sections are for the swarm model. And here you can see the, you know, for x, y, and z, and f, the, the means are basically zero. And the sigma is, you know, around three nanotesla, two nanotesla for the z component. That's really good. And then DMSP is up here, a much worse situation. We have, you know, a significant bias in the x and the z components. Sigma is around like 20 nanotesla for x and z, 12 nanotesla for y. So so much larger scatter, and there's some biases in there. And again, I think that's uh, from non-potential fields in this data. OK, so now we can look at the quality of this model compared with the swarm model. One of the metrics we have for this is to look at a power spectrum. Uh, so similar to a Fourier transform, we're really doing a spherical harmonic transform. So we can look at the spherical harmonic degree on the horizontal axis and the power in each degree. Uh, so I'm comparing three different models here. One is the chaos model from another group at DTU in Denmark. And then I built, and then my swarm model, and then the DMSP model. So the red and the green curves are essentially on top of each other. So that means the, you know, both of these are built from swarm data. So it's not surprising that they agree very well. The difference between those two is shown here in orange. So that's many, this is a logarithmic scale. So there's many orders of magnitude less than the signal itself. But you can see the DMSP model in blue follows the power spectrum of the other models up until about degree 12 or so. And then it starts deviating. And this pink curve is showing you the difference between my swarm model and the DMSP model. And so the difference stays below the signal itself up until about degree 13, and then crosses. And so basically, all the coefficients above degree 12 are completely untrustworthy for the DMSP model. But the remarkable thing is that we can actually get to spherical harmonic degree 12 with its DMSP data set, which is already an improvement over the observatory network. Because back before the satellite era, people were building models from the observatory network. And, and for those models, they were getting to maybe degree 8 or 9, maybe even 10, but definitely not degree 12. So the DMSP data is providing more information than the observatories can provide. Next, we can look at the secular variations. This is the first time derivative of those Gauss coefficients. And again, uh, you can see the, the DMSP model is agreeing fairly well with the swarm model up until about degree 10. And again, that's, that's a really nice result. The, the models that people build from observatories really can only get to about degree 8 for the, the secular variation. So we're, we're an improvement over that. And then finally, the secular acceleration is shown here. Uh, 
and the interesting thing about this, so secular acceleration is, is the most difficult signal to extract uh, from the core field measurements. And any, any amount of noise or, or um, things like that can really contaminate this signal. And so you can see even between the two swarm models, so, so basically the, the, the red model is, is a swarm-based model built by another group, and then my swarm-based model I mean, we agree pretty well for degrees three, four, five, six, but even in the dipole term, degree one and two, there's differences between two models built out of the same data set. And this is because the most likely reason is because of the magnetospheric ring current. So we have this internal dipole from the core. We also have this external dipole from the ring current. And it's very difficult to separate those two. And so you're seeing that here. So depending on the ways that the different groups pre-process their data and fit these models, there's actually differences. And we saw this in the previous IGRF call, too, when we had about 10 different teams submitting candidate models to IGRF. Everybody disagreed on what the dipole term should be for the, for the IGRF model. Uh, and it's due to this difficulty in separating the external dipole from the internal dipole. But just uh, going to the, the DMSP, uh, you can see that DMSP is a little bit uh, it's showing more power in these coefficients than the swarm models. Um, but it more or less agrees pretty well up until about degree six. And then I had to heavily damp the higher degrees uh, to, to prevent wildly unphysical solutions. So just looking at this spectrum, it looks like DMSP is actually not too bad up until degree six. And that, that's, I mean, that's more than we were hoping for when we, when we started this study. <coughs> Um, I mean, just as a rule of thumb, if you just built models from the observatory network, you'd probably get up to degree three uh, or so just from the observatory. So, so DMSP is getting us to degree six, which gives us a lot more insight into what the core field is doing. Okay, so now I'd like to show you some, uh, some of these secular acceleration maps um, so from DMSP. So what I did was I took the DMSP F17 data from an eight-year time period, 2009 to 2017, so that covers this whole gap period. And uh, I, I, I basically used a sliding window, so I took a three-year window starting at the beginning and just advanced that window by 30 days. So every 30 days I built a model, advanced the window, built another model. So I built a total of 61 models with this sliding window approach. And so I have a prompt here. I couldn't embed the movie in my... Uh, so I'm going to play a movie for you, for you. And so what you're looking at on the left, so this is the secular acceleration as seen at the core mental boundary. So this is the, the second derivative of the radial component of the magnetic field. So this is how the magnetic field is accelerating. And this is in units of microtesla per square year. So on the left is the DMSP models. And on the right is the chaos model from, from the other group at, at DTU. Um, and so all of these blobs you're seeing are basically patches at different parts of the world where, where we see accelerations. And so um, yeah, I'll let it run a little bit longer and just point out a few things. So yeah, here uh, in the very beginning of the talk, I, I showed you similar maps and, and just told you at the low latitudes at the equatorial region, we see these, these interesting pulses. And so this is now 2012, so this is in that gap period where we don't have uh, CHAMP or SWARM data. And you can see right here in the southern Atlantic, you get these, these you know, red, blue, red pulses, and you also see that in chaos. Chaos is, is using observatory data during this period with a lot of regularization. Uh, and so DMSP is actually seeing these pulses, which was a big surprise to us. And then if we let it run a little longer, so three years later, the claim is that these are gonna reverse polarity Yeah, so now, I mean, before it was red, blue, red, and now you can see it's kind of blue, red, blue again. And so what this means is that um, DMSP is actually seeing these, this standing wave that's being generated deep inside the Earth's core at these low latitudes. And I think the only other thing I wanted to point out from this is, uh, so not all of these blobs are, are actual real signal. And as I mentioned before, the secular acceleration is highly susceptible to noise in the data set. 
So for example, here you can see in Antarctica, DM, the DMSP is predicting a large acceleration in the core field in the South Pole. But we know, actually, that, that this is impossible. We know that in the South Pole, things don't really move around very much. I mean, the, the, the magnetic pole, the South magnetic pole is basically staying put for many years. It's not, it's not moving. We know there is, a lot, there is acceleration at the North Pole. The, the, nor the magnetic North Pole is actually, it's been accelerating in, pre in recent years. But the South Pole things are relatively stable. So we were highly skeptical of this feature. And you can see chaos doesn't, doesn't predict anything in the South Pole at this time. And so um, I can tell you that this is actually just noise. This is due to noise. And I think it's due to the fact that uh, at the high latitudes, we're not really able to downweight the effects of these high latitude current systems in the DMSP model because. I was going to remark that, I mean, to us, to look at that and say, oh, that's the, that's the high latitude potential. That's what it looks like. Yeah. Well, except, well, except this is a. Coincidence. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, I mean, it, it's almost certain that the, the high latitude ha has contaminated the Gauss coefficients, which is leading to this. So why would it do it in the South Pole? Well, yeah, it depends on, on the data selection criteria. I, I don't know for this particular, well, I mean, there is a signal in the North Pole, too, although chaos sees it as well. And we do know that there is acceleration in the North Pole. So maybe, maybe it actually sees some, some combination of real signal and contamination here. Um, but in the South Pole, yeah, it's, it's just completely wrong. Um, but in the next slide, I'm going to show some comparisons with observatories in, these, in, the, in the polar regions. So maybe, maybe I'll answer the question then. OK, so yeah, so I think I'm, I'm getting to the last slide. So I wanted to to show a validation of this DMSP model with ground observatories. So I picked three observatories. One is Kourou here in South America, right in that region where these interesting equatorial pulses are occurring. And then I picked one, uh, Yellow Knife, which is up here in northern Canada, near the Royal Oval. And then uh, Mawson Observatory, which is in Antarctica at the South Pole. And so I'll show you observations from these observatories along with the predictions from DMSP. So, so this is Kourou. This is the, at the Equatorial Station in South America. So this is a time series starting 1999 going to the present. The, the gray dots are the differences of annual means. So these are, again, nanotesla per year. So this is how much the field is changing uh, in time, the secular variation. And this is the, the R component, theta, and phi. And the red curve is the chaos model. Now, chaos actually directly uses the observatory data in the model. So it's not surprising that chaos fits this data very well. And the blue curve is my DMSP model. And you can see that it's, it's capturing these, these variations very well uh, in the DMSP model. And even though the DMSP, I'm calibrating the DMSP data with observatories, but I'm not directly using the observatories in the modeling itself. So, I mean, they're not completely independent, but they're more independent than the chaos is. Um, and what you can see is that, uh, for example, here there's a sharp transition in the Kourou data. Uh, you can kind of see, and DMSP actually captures that short scale variation, whereas chaos is uh, much more smooth. They, they apply a lot of temporal smoothing to the chaos model to try to, uh, so you can see it's much smoother th through these transitions. Uh, but DMSP is actually able to ca capture that sharp transition. So we're very happy to see this. Um, and I mean, these, you know, th these, these wave structures you see, that, I mean, that's basically the pulses I've been talking about, uh, these, these you know, six-year period pulses that you can see uh, in this long time series. So moving to the North Pole, this is the Yellowknife Observatory. You can see the scatter of the data is much higher because of these uh, polar current systems. But basically, the DMSP, we're, we're, you know, we're getting the right order of magnitude of the secular variation at the North Pole. Um, and so this might answer your question a little bit that, for some reason, it, it's working fairly well at the North Pole. Uh, I don't have a, an explanation of why it's working better than the South Pole. But for example, here in the phi component, I mean, it really nicely captures this, this sharp acceleration that we see. Uh, and there is a lot of acceleration going on in the North Pole from in the core field. So it's doing a fairly good job up there. 
And now going to the South Pole, this is Mawson Observatory in Antarctica. Again, we get a lot of scatter in the data. Uh, you can see that the DMSP is, is showing a lot of these kind of sawtooth-like patterns. That's just because I, I haven't applied any temporal smoothing. So I'm using this sliding window approach. I build a model, and then I slide the window 30 days, build a model. I haven't tried to smooth out uh, the time series at all. So that's why you see this sort of jerky uh, features in the data. So eventually, I'll, I'll try to smooth this out to make it look nicer. But, uh, I mean, but what you can see is, is essentially giving the right order of magnitude, although, uh, I mean, I'll just point out here, I think, I mean, this is what we were looking at in that, in that global map where we saw some strong acceleration at the South Pole. Um, around this time, and you can see the DMSP model's predicting is, is actually pretty far away from the data by, I don't know, is it 10 nanotesla per year? So it's not, it's not doing as well in the South Pole as it was doing in the equator in the North Pole. So yeah, it's, it's probably due to some kind of noise coming from the, lo the, the current systems there. I, I don't know exactly why we see it at the South Pole and not the North Pole, but um, there's room for improvement, obviously. So. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, okay, so we've, we've done a, an intensive cleaning and calibration of these DMSP data sets for four satellites. Work is ongoing. We're still trying to improve this um, because, as I mentioned, there's, there, are, there are these non-potential fields in this data set that we think uh, we can improve upon. We've built some main field secular variation acceleration models and we've compared with swarm models. And uh, I mean, the, the biggest surprise through this work, I mean, when we started working with DMSP, we didn't expect to really get any useful data out of this, uh, out of this study. But because of how noisy and the, I mean, the data was, I mean, you saw what the data looked like in the beginning with all these horrible jumps and everything. But, but it turns out, in the end, we were able to get a main field to spherical harmonic degree 12, uh, variation to degree 10, acceleration to degree 6. And all of those are better than what we can do with the observatory network alone. And so that's already an improvement. Um, yeah, so we get reasonable agreement between the DMSB predicted secular variation and the ground observatories. Uh, the South Pole needs a lot of improvement. And probably the most surprising result is actually DMSP can resolve this six-year period equatorial wave, which is generated by some kind of wave process in the core. And this was unexpected. We were, I mean, we were hoping that would happen, but we didn't, we didn't know if it would. And uh, so that's basically the end. And thank you for listening. Yeah, there, there was uh, there have been a few papers written on it. So th this was really just discovered 2014. So there hasn't been a whole lot of theoretical work done to try to explain the origin. There's a couple papers written by Arnaud Chulia, who who works on core flow dynamics, and he speculates that they could be due to Rossby waves in the top layer of the Earth's core. So Rossby waves are just waves that occur when you have a rotating fluid, and it's due to the Coriolis force. Um, they exist in the atmosphere. They exist uh, in, in different fluids on a rotating planet. Um, he basically looked at some of the CHAMP data and said that these signatures are consistent with Rossby waves. But I mean, that's a far cry from actually proving that that's the cause. There was some theoretical work done in the 1980s, which speculated that uh, there could be waves like this due to other types of um, oscillations in the core. I mean, but nobody really has has definitively shown what's causing this. I mean, to do that, you'd really have to go to a physics-based dynamo model of the core and try to drive that model with some kind of data input, like, like what we're getting from these satellites, to, to really try to see if there's a consistent mechanism that, that can produce this. But I mean, nobody has done that, to my knowledge. Oh. 
okay, yeah, so you're, so you're asking how do we get a signal no, with... Uh, Well, so there's a difference between, um, so I mean, if that 20 nanotesla noise is Gaussian noise, I mean, we can fit a model through there and still come up with a, an accurate model. So the question is whether it's Gaussian or some other type of noise. I mean, the, the hope was that it's just Gaussian. So yeah, it's very noisy, but if it all averages to zero, we can fit a model through that and get the right mean, get, get the right values in the end. Um, I mean, that was unknown at the beginning of this study. We didn't know what type of noise this was. But the results seem to indicate that it can be done, which means that perhaps a lot of this noise is Gaussian. Uh, so what, what you're looking at is, by anybody else's standards, incredibly slowly varying. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. varying on the, on the order of years rather than minutes right. as, as right. yeah. There is speculation, but uh, I mean, I, there's no definitive evidence at this point, as far as I know. The six year transmitted on it, is it persistent or is it only occurred recently? We've only seen it in the satellite era because the observatories are just too sparse to get a global picture. And, and even before Ersted was launched in 1999, uh, I mean, the quality of the observatory data was, was less. I mean, there, there have been more observatories added since then. So we, we have a, a larger network now with, with you know, better um, quality control of the data and so on. There was a couple papers published in the 1980s which uh, said they saw something similar to the six-day wave. But I think the, the data they had at that time was just, uh, it just wasn't um, dense enough. I mean, it, it was too sparse to really conclude uh, about this wave. So it was really during the, the satellite era that we, we confirmed the existence of this wave. But it's likely that it's occurred before the satellite. And there's no reason why the core should suddenly produce waves only when we launch satellites. So it's, it, it's certainly possible that this wave has been existing before, but. Uh, but we have GMST 30 years old. Yeah, but the problem is the, the older DMSP satellites are, are just completely unusable. I mean, the, the magnetometers on the older DMSP were mounted onto the body of the spacecraft. They weren't on a boom. And I've looked at some... The older one, 80s, <laughs> it produced the No, I think... F My understanding was that F-15 was the first boom mounted. Oh, but yours, okay. I've never looked at the data from, I've looked at data from F13, which had a body mounted magnetometer, and it, the data is absolutely horrible. I mean, it's completely. Okay. Do you remember which, which na number it was? Team is eight. Okay, I've never looked at that data. So it, 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 seems, it seems to me that there's not necessarily a cycle in this wave wavelength pattern, but it's, it seemed like it was phase shifting. Is that a reasonable uh, interpretation? Well. You mean like every three years it changes polarity, like a like a standing wave, or uh, these are these are these are accelerations. These are not the not the velocities themselves, but the acceleration. Right. Shifting in longitude, 
like, what do you mean shifting in longitude? Not not moving. It's not traveling. Well, it's a, a slowly, uh, uh, if you have a, a, a standing wave that is, is, is quasi stationary, and it's slowly shifting in longitude. Oh, okay. So it's not a standing wave. It's a. It's actually a, a traveling wave. <laughs> <laughs> slowly. It's very, it's very Yeah, I mean, there have been some studies. So, I mean, sort of the next step is to take these maps and try to do some kind of harmonic analysis to see whether these waves are, are propagating east or west. Uh, you, you, you can you can look into that. Um, and there have been some some studies of that, and, and their conclusion was that there there is a standing wave, but there may be there may be some components that are also slowly moving, as you suggest. I don't remember exactly which wave numbers and, and the velocities and so on. But because, of course, you have a full spectrum of waves. It's not just a single wave. There's probably many different waves combining to, to see what we actually see at the surface. Uh, the yeah. Well, yeah, but we, we when we when we build these models, we we exclude the ionosphere by selecting nighttime data. We select very quiet, you know, KP is small. So if if they're due to ionospheric, it would be very unlikely. I mean, because I mean, we try to minimize the ionospheric, we select data. But how would the tie, how would a neutral tide pr produce a magnetic signal without a conductivity or? Right, but then you have a con you have an electrical conductivity on the day side, which is modulated by these ties, and so you get the currents that are modulated. But if if we only select ti if we select data where there is no conductivity in the ionosphere, there shouldn't be any electrical currents producing yeah. magnetic fields. I think I think that if you, if you were if what you were seeing were actually tidal and ionospheric interaction signals, then you would see patterns that look like known tidal features in the ionosphere, and you don't. You know, we, we don't see a, a we don't see a five. Yeah, because I mean, you're, so, so you'd be talking about a, a six-year tide in the ionosphere. I'm talking about the pattern. I'm talking about the pattern on the on the plots you show. They have five or six nodes. Hmm. Right. But that, that is the, you have a, a, a pattern that has five or six peaks in it around, around the equator. Right? Right. And that's not what we see in the ionosphere. We see, let's say, four or five, maybe three. Yeah. And, and two, and one. Right. Yeah, but that's, those are daily tides. That's DE2, DE3. Right. I mean, those are, those are not six-year period tides. Because um, if you take two colonies and average them, and you see that only one will average all of the signal, some change in frequency signal. If you have other contributions, you might get a figure, but I mean, it has to be magnetic field. I, I doubt that you can find a signal on the I mean, <laughs> Right. If, if there were a tidal signal there, you would 
rest of the. Which is, which is, you know, <clears throat> sort of suspiciously close to your maximum, uh, uh, to your maximum uh, uh, order. So, so, well, we can get six, we can get six with coefficients. careful of that because, because something that goes up to n equals 6 will always look like a bad part of 6 nodes in it, right? Oh, you're talking about the degree 6. Okay. Yeah, degree in order 6. Um, well, with, yeah, so with DMSP, we can only go to degree 6. Right? Anything beyond that is just noise. But with swarm, we can go to higher degrees, like 9 or 10. And you get a similar pattern. And we get a similar pattern. Even when you add additional Yes. So that, that's more comfortable because, yeah. because uh, you'll, you'll always, you'll, you know, and that's the thing about this data filtering stuff. You can, you can figure stuff with a bunch of Fourier terms and filter it. And lo and behold, you see the filter. Right. So yeah. you always got to be careful. People always find what they're looking for. Say, Look, I filtered with an equal swarm. And lo and behold, it's more. <laughs> So you almost have to be a little careful with that. But, uh, you know, this pattern is very, is, 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 is very striking. I, I think it's either five or six. Yeah, I mean, this, this chaos either model. five or six nodes. This chaos model is built from swarm data. They, they provide the secular acceleration up to degree nine, at least, maybe even 10 or 11. Um, and, I, and if you look at the same maps up to degree, this is only plotted to degree six, this map, but. If you plot the same map to degree nine, you'll see very similar features. You also see smaller scale features that are the higher degrees. But, but these features you see here are still present. We'll take one last question. Yeah. In geodynamical models, I mean, the speed is generated by these convection cells, which are aligned with the axis of rotation. What should be the baseline that they expect to be there? Is that something that we could relate to these? Um, convection cells which they avoid maintaining the magnetic field or is it different? I think these are different. Um, yeah, I mean at least from, <laughs> from, from the past knowledge that we have about the large scale field and how it changes from the convection, I mean they change on much lar larger time scales. I mean several decades or more. These small scale six year time frames I mean, that's never been seen before with, with the dynamo models with these convection patterns. So it's hypothesized that this is due to something completely new that hasn't been modeled before with these dynamo models. And so that's why uh, some authors have, have hypothesized it's due to these Rossby waves, which uh, haven't been included in dynamo models before. And these dynamo, I mean, they are all rotating systems, so the principle is capable of having one state is just that they're too big for this. I think it also has to do with how they define the different layers in the cores. I think you need a, a sort of a stable stratified layer at the top of the core to have these. And some dynamo models may not include that. Um, yeah, I think to get to the bottom of this, we'd have to probably design some kind of a, a dynamo study to, to try to replicate this. All right, let's uh, thank Patrick again. Okay. Well, thank you. Sort of six year period. This is, this is you know, recently discovered that anyone sort of gone back and looked at, you know, we're trying to clean up. That's a good question. I, and like, I think that would be a natural. You know, I don't know if you know Tariq. Like, he used to be at the past Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's, they did, I've met him before. you know, all this data going back to like uh, 100 years or something. You know? That's a fantastic and idea. Sort of gone back and said, okay, now that we know this is here, and we yeah. have. You know, some data that's reasonably quality. You know, they look at it. It's a natural thing to do. 